Ha! Beautiful. Right. Okay. Sorry for that. So, um, my name is Simon Ratcliffe, and uh, I work for a project called SKA South Africa, and it's basically a government-funded entity um, set up with uh, three purposes in mind. This was established in 2005, and uh, our original thinking was to pursue three avenues, the first of which was a human capital development program, and um, that was mostly to provide bursaries for a wide range of students to get involved in, in engineering and computing, and uh, to date we've had uh, over 400 bursaries through that program in the, in the seven years it's been running. The second prong of that was... Spread about through it. Sorry? Oh. This implementation, so lots of if status in blah 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 then else if state if if then else i'm back wait okay right i think we should do that we should cross audio from the two venues it would be a really entertaining spectacle <laughs> i'll try and buy out the words as we go so we'll see how it works okay the second prong was to build a radio telescope that would be of a world class and uh, we're currently in the midst of building that it's known as meerkat and it should be complete by 2016. The third leg was to compete for an international project known as the Square Kilometre Array. This is a radio telescope some hundred to a thousand times bigger than any that's previously been envisaged. Uh, it's a project of the order of three billion euros, and uh, it was first mooted in 1990. There was a long competition for, for the site, eventually came down to ourselves, and uh, I think the Australians are bugging this since I'm going to mention them. Ourselves and our erstwhile brethren, the Australians, we were competing to for the rights to host the Square Kilometre Array, and in May this year we were awarded 75% of the SKA, and the Australians got 25%. So from that point we've been quite successful. So who's heard of the SKA? Let me see. That's brilliant. I don't even need to talk about it. So I'm not going to. Uh, what I'll start off doing is just a little interlude, and I'm going to talk about optical astronomy, radio astronomy, kind of how it works, what the science is behind it. So feel free to fall asleep if you want until I start talking about Python about halfway through the talk. But uh, if you're interested in some little bits about what we do, I'll start off with that. So, in the beginning, long ago, in the 1600s, optical astronomy, I won't talk about Galileo, because he only had a one-meter telescope, which is pretty wussy, but this guy, old Hevelius, 64-foot telescope, you know, that's the, the way to do things properly. He built a 144-foot telescope, but it broke in half, and then they decided, you know, this was the, not such a good idea, and uh, refractor telescopes kind of uh, met their logical conclusion, and we invented reflectors, and optical astronomy has been going for sort of 400 years. What that means is that we can now do things with very modest telescopes. This is a 2.2 meter telescope. We can see things like Centaurus A. So this is a galaxy, um, very distant galaxy, 100 billion stars, a nice d dust cloud through the middle. Very pretty picture. Beautiful science can come out of that. The interesting thing with optical astronomy, though, is you only see a really small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, you know, the inevitable XKCD cartoon. To illustrate this fact, is that what we're looking at here is just the little visible portion if we're using optical astronomy. And you know everything from the sinister Google projects in gamma rays up to Steve Ballmer's mind control rays down in radio, we miss all of that stuff if we're just using an optical telescope. So the science has developed, astronomy has developed to the point where multi-wavelength is really important. And uh, where we fit in is the radio side. So down there towards radio, TV, microwaves in the gigahertz range, that's where we're beginning to look. And what this lets you do is see different things. So if we take that previous observation, we're now going to look at it with a radio telescope instead, and what we see is, aha, there's a whole lot of stuff we didn't see before. So that's that same galaxy in the top right. Centaurus A, now you observe it with a radio telescope, and you see those uh, false color jets coming out the side. That's what you see with the radio image. So before, you thought it was just this little galaxy, but actually this little galaxy is just spewing out these jets of gas out into the void that you would not have seen at all. So it's like taking off the blindfold and suddenly seeing what's, what's out there. It gets even more impressive with Centaurus A. So the bottom right is that same little optical image. That's what it looks like in the top, top right there. Is, that's that central zoom we had in before. On the left-hand side there, that's an even bigger series of emission, a bigger emission region around this galaxy. If you could see that with the naked eye, it would be about 10 degrees in the sky. Now, to give you an estimate, the full moon is half a degree. So this thing is like would be a massive, epic sight up in the sky. Um, of course, if we did see radio waves instead of optical waves, we'd have eyes like a meter in diameter, and a trip to the optician would be pretty expensive, and rather unwieldy. Our heads would be rolling around. But that's why we build radio telescopes, so we can see this stuff. You'll notice, though, those who are observant among you, that I had a 2.2 meter telescope in the optical, 
coupled with the largest radio telescope we've built to date, known as VLA. So the problem with radio astronomy is the signals are very weak. And to give you a bit of a comparative energy chart, it takes around a joule of energy to melt a snowflake. So ice has quite a high calorific content, so a joule of energy is reasonably modest. The mosquito buzzing around the room ready to sting you and give you something horrible, you know, we're talking about less than a microjoule worth of kinetic energy that buzzes around. The VLA, the largest telescope currently standing on Earth, in a day collects a picojoule, if it's lucky. So the amount of energy you receive from these sources out in space is incredibly small and incredibly weak. So to do that, we have to build bigger and bigger telescopes, bigger and better all the time. And that's what we do. So we started off in 1936. It was kind of the dawn of radio astronomy. The venerable Grot Riebe built his 9-meter dish in his backyard. He built it all by himself, um, which was quite an achievement back in the day. He fell off it and all sorts of interesting things. So we built bigger and bigger dishes as we went. In 1955, we built the Lovell Telescope out in the UK in Joggle Bank. 76 meter. That was too small. We needed a bigger dish because, you know, we're astronomers and we need big things. The 100 meter dish in Effelsberg, which is really impressive. The problem is you start building these dishes bigger and bigger, and eventually your engineer will come along with his hard hat on and say, stop building it bigger, it's going to fall apart. And then you think, ah, that's just nanny state thinking, I can build whatever I want. So you build it and then it falls down. <laughs> so this is what happened to the Green Bank Telescope uh, out in the US. The sort of custodian arrived one morning and probably got quite a fright and drove away. This whole thing collapsed overnight. So building big single dishes kind of reaches a, a logical conclusion. So in order to advance our collecting area, and that's really what it's about. You need to have surface area on the ground to collect these very wispy nebulous photons that are arriving from outer space. You need more collecting area. So instead of building big dishes, what we do is we build lots of small ones. So here's one we made earlier. This is Cat 7 sitting out in the crew. And um, this is kind of our stepping stone towards Meerkat. So we've, we've completed this. We've been running it for about two years. And uh, it's kind of a proving ground towards heading up to Meerkat. This is only seven antennas. Meerkat will be 64 antennas. Um, and it's, it's quite amazing to head up to the crew there and you have this kind of barren desert wasteland and suddenly these white mushroom-shaped antennas just sprout out of the desert. It's really cool. And so Meerkat will have 64 in 2016 or so if we stick to our, our timelines and uh, the project director will skin us if we don't, so we better. The SKA takes that to a whole new level. So 2,700 antennas about 1,800 of which will be situated in a 20-kilometer zone in the Northern Cape. The rest will be spread out kind of through South Africa. We have uh, partner countries. There'll be stations in Madagascar, Mauritius. So, you know, if you want to be a station operator in radio astronomy, the Mauritius one's up for grabs, which is probably a good, uh, yeah, nice little venue to be posted to. So this will be, you know, really a massive, massive undertaking. But so why do we build these instruments in the first place? They look pretty. We can talk about them. We get funding. The reason we build these things is to do some science. So. This is what we can do with CAT7 at the moment. So this is kind of basic junior training wheel science, but it's still quite cool. So again, using our competitive Australians, they did an observation in 1974. We said, ha ha, only 36 years later, we can do the same observation, which is what we did on the right-hand side there. And um, what's cool about this is the galaxy that's actually producing the gas is just a single pixel in the middle of it. Boom, you can't even see it. The rest of the stuff is just all the gas that this galaxy is spewing out. And uh, it gets this kind of tail shape because the galaxy is actually going that way. And there's medium, and there's a you know there's a magnetic field, and it's bending the, the, the gas. So I won't talk about too much because it's too much science, but it's really exciting and interesting. Centaurus B is a nearby dwarf galaxy. It's kind of pretty, so we took pictures of it. Other things we can do is look for transient events, things that go bang in the night sky, and we go and find out what happened. Um, so there's a telescope called Fermi, and that looks in, in sort of gamma rays. So not only does it look for sinister Google projects, but it looks for things that go pop out in space. And the, the nice thing about looking in gamma is if you detect something in gamma radiation you typically see it in, in, the, the shorter wa in the longer wavelengths at a later time. So you've got an advanced warning. And that's what happened. 20th of October, this thing went bump. We got a notification that said something's happened. We started observing it with CAT7. And this is the sort of light curve of that source over the next couple of days. And we saw it was kind of quiescent and then spiked up nicely. So it was kind of good, you know, good basic science that we've been able to do with CAT7. The SKA takes us into the area of big science because you know, these days you have to put big in front of everything so you can get funding. So they'll probably invent some new word just now that we'll have some stupendous science. But we've got big science for now. There's kind of four main goals of the SKA. There's looking at, um, you know, strong field tests of gravity. So you look at pulsars and, and gravity radiation from merging black holes. And you understand, does GR work in the kind of extreme environments? There's things like looking at cosmic magnetism. So we know how magnetism works on a sort of small scale, individual bodies. But we don't really understand 
how magnetic fields sustain themselves on galactic scales. There's understanding how galaxies form. And this is kind of the question of dark matter and dark energy. How do you form galaxies? Do you have a dark matter halo and the matter infalls and turns into stars? Or do you just create stars and then they bash together under gravity? These are questions we're still trying to answer with the SKA. So big science is kind of what's coming. That's the promise of the instrument. To do big science, you need big iron. So don't worry about too much about this slide. It's got some numbers on which you've got to memorize because I'll refer to them later. But basically, there's lots of computations, lots of data flowing. Radio astronomy is basically a data science. The headline news is this, though, the SKA, an exabyte per day worth of data. And that's not even the raw data. That's kind of reasonably useful data we need to look at. So it's quite a bit of data. So I was trying to think about how to, how to visualize this. And it's impossible to visualize it. You can put all the numbers out, politician style, which I'll do. But um, this is my attempt at visualizing it. If you take Constantiaberg, which is a reasonably big mountain, ignore Devil's Peak in the background, take Constantiaberg and put it in your Blendtec 5000, <laughs> turn it into sand, pretty much beach sand consistency. Each s grain of sand uses one bit. That gives you roughly an exabyte worth of storage. So this is left as an exercise to the reader. Go home, get your blender out, and try and figure out how it works. But that's, it's, it's, it's impossible to visualize how much data this is. It's just data, 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 data. Fortunately for Meerkat, we don't have this big data problem, we have medium data problem. So for medium data, take an eye device and give it to all the friendly fanboys in the teenage bracket in the world, 1.1 billion teenagers, take their eye devices away, put them in the blender again, much to the sobs and dismays, and you end up with not an exabyte, but a petabyte of data a day, which is a little bit more manageable. Terms, conditions, apply, disclaimers, etc. So dealing with this medium data, this is what we're doing for Meerkat. So it's a bit of a boring slide, lots of numbers. Essentially, the take-home message from these kind of slides is to say, we've got a lot of things that need to happen to our data. It comes in quite a raw form. We need to do quite a few transformations. We need to analyze it. We need to look for artifacts in the data. We need to look for defects in the data, correct those in kind of high speed in real time. Um, you'll see some numbers in our flows. We have you know, hundreds of gigabits a second coming into various streams, uh, 10 petabytes of archive storage, which will quite big out in the crew, so we're building a big data center with a big hole um, out in the crew to, to house this. A whole lot of uh, bits of infrastructure that need to go into building this telescope, obviously which will eventually map to a whole lot of software. So I'm first talking about a bit of hardware, boring, 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 and then we'll talk about software, but I just want to give a flavor for how we are tackling the problem. One of the ways we tackle big data and big challenges is to parallelize. So you're all familiar with parallelization. One of the things we have as an advantage in radio astronomy is we have a natural axis of parallelization. So we observe a certain band of spectrum in the sky, a certain range of frequencies, and we can pretty much process each of those frequencies independently. So the kind of like coarse grain top level parallelization we get is quite useful um, because we can immediately split things up as you've seen here. So we tried to take that parallel s s idea a bit further forward. We have a parallel file system on top of which we have a parallel file container. So we use HDF5. Anyone here try to do parallel stuff with HDF5? You can tell us how to actually do it. It doesn't work too well. Anyway, we're trying. We're getting, it's getting better. But um, using things like Lustre as a parallel file system is fraught with danger. We can't afford GPFS from IBM, so we'll hopefully make it work at some stage. Um, we have much finer grain parallelization as well. Again, it's just a pretty slide with little things moving around. But the idea is to indicate that at a third tier of parallelization, we have this very, very fine grain stuff. We use GPUs and accelerator technology quite a bit. Um, that's where we want to really do things, very, very lightweight computations in a massively parallel way. If we were going to build this thing yesterday, we could do it. Um, it's just to show that you know we, there's some bits and pieces and throw some hardware at it and the thing happens. If we were going to build it today, we'd use probably the only thing we'd change is instead of using GPUs, we'd use this thing called the Xeon Phi or Knight's Corner or Knight's Ferry or Larrabee or whatever you want to call it. Intel keep changing its name. Essentially, this is the middle ground between four or eight cores on your CPU and a million threads on your GPU, it gives you maybe 100 or 200 true x86 threads um, in, a, in a nice package, a PCI Express board or on a single die. So it's quite interesting technology. If I was going to build this tomorrow, this is what I would do, what I'm trying to do. We've got this project underway to build something called Iron Hive. Basically, again, I take all these eye devices before I grind them up, I take out their chipset, a nice A6, put them in a big box, and uh, you kind of get this like supercomputer that's very optimal for our needs because what it has is it has lots of I.O. compared to how many flops it has. So you can see we've got this, this sort of nice little box that we can throw out in the field and have this supercomputer that sits out there. 
and I'll get back to why Python is a good fit for us, particularly because of the, the low computational density or computational intensity of, uh, of our computing problem. So onto software and onto Dave Beasley, who has the quote of the quote of the year. I think that's far. Or you know, this is the guy who wrote Swig, so he's kind of Mr. C++, but he's decided that life is too short and he'd rather enjoy himself and not write any more C++. So I heartily agree with that message. And I think what comes out of a message like that, and if you sort of think about it and take it to its extreme, is kind of some philosophy that you can emerge from that. So I ha I'm hesitant to use the word agile because then we have to start scrumming and I don't want to do that. But develop in an iterative fashion is, is kind of the, 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 the kernel, the essence of that. You know, Develop small steps don't just try and do the whole thing in one shot. Common elements, so my favorite common element that everyone uses is Corba, which is just no oh, horrible. It's not lightweight and it's not simple and never, you know, it doesn't help you at all. You end up just maintaining Corba rather than doing anything else. So common elements are great, but they should be lightweight and simple and easy for people to pick up and understand. Um, test as you go, we've talked about this a bit. Deploy intelligently. Alex talked quite extensively about how to deploy well, so, you know, I really second his argument about being able to deploy a revision and roll back to a previous revision really simply. It helps a lot. Solve today's problem, not tomorrow. It's very tempting to think, oh, I'm embarking on this grand challenge. I'm going to build this architect. It's going to scale for a million years, etc., etc. But you never get around to solving today's problem, which is much simpler. So you have to kind of temper the enthusiasm for building a grand edifice with getting the job done. Allied to that is that done is the engine of more. You can't get to the next task, as obvious as it sounds, unless you finish the current task. And you know, there's a lot of not finishing the current task because we're trying to optimize and make it perfect. So simple is better than complex. It goes back to how we, how we talk about common elements. But simplicity is quite hard to engineer in many ways. It's often easier to throw down quite a complex solution than to think about how can we make this as simple as possible. Optimize last. So this is my favorite thing to do. In some ways, I think if you start and you sit down and you write C, you're almost optimizing first. You're immediately assuming that I have to write this optimal solution. So you sit there and you start and, and you know, it, it, it's great, you know, I've done it in my time, and you end up with this wonderful thing with this beautiful point of arithmetic, and you think, ha, no one else will ever understand this, so I'm very proud of myself. But that's kind of optimizing right at front, and then, you know, I think that's, a, that's, that's not the way to go. Commodity is king, use what's out there, use what people are, are, are putting money into and impetus into. And sort of the final thing that, that I always like to say is perfection is an illusion. You can never achieve it, achieve what's fit for purpose and, and good enough to get the job done. Don't seek perfection if you don't need it. So all this philosophy is wonderful, and of course, what it brings you to is Python. The only thing that fits all our philosophical goals and matches what we need to do is Python. So as the SKA project and uh, my colleagues from uh, the rest of the software team will be talking more extensively in more detail about our Python use, we use Python pretty much everywhere. It's all over the show. So around about 30 in-house modules plus dependencies on all the usual suspects. These are kind of the ones we use quite actively. The other ones that we've, you know, we test out in the process of using, but... Uh, it's, again, that kind of community feel of Python that, uh, that we enjoy. So the same slide now with its hovercraft being full of eels, for those Python fans in the audience. We sort of, you know, Python for us is encroaching everywhere. My personal goal is to see how far we can possibly take Python, and I'm hopeful that by the end of building Meerkat, this will just be this Pythonic blur, and, uh, you know, everywhere is, is deeply Pythonic. To talk through a few of the little highlights, and I won't talk too much about some of these because they'll be mentioned by my colleagues, um, it almost starts with the fact that we do all our control stuff in, in, in Python, and particularly we use an IPython shell to run the instrument. So, you know, we have more elaborate, uh, you know, GUIs and, and, and scheduling systems on top of this now, but basically you can just fire up an IPython session, type configure, and you can get access to the entire facility. You can control it, you can monitor it, you can do whatever you want. And in particular, it introspects the devices at connection. So you don't have to know beforehand what the static configuration is like. It figures out what's there. That's been very useful for us, but I won't dwell on that for now. We have this package which is emerging called Cat Live, and this is an example of how you get this merger of the scripting capabilities and the data handling capabilities of, of Python in that this lets you connect into the telescope, get a live stream of data out that's augmented with information about where things are pointing and uh, environmental information, other bits and pieces, but have access to this you know, fairly large amount of data coming in at high speed right at your Python prompt. As long as you're intelligent with the way you use that data and you use NumPy effectively, um, you can actually get very nice performance and you can kind of do completely ad hoc and on the fly uh, scientific experiments uh, as you go. 
I mentioned sort of data and the, the data side is very important to us and uh, so one of the things we spend quite a lot of time is looking to see how do we move data around in the telescope and can we move it around in a way that is very amenable to writing code on the other ends of it. And so we kind of took the decision that we would write this data exchange protocol that was as close to NumPy as, NumPy as a NumPy array sits in memory, as close to NumPy on the wire. So you can basically imagine it as a NumPy transport, particularly a NumPy transport that's optimized for different kinds of devices. So currently we have FPGA implementations, we have normal CPU implementations, we have uh, sort of GPU optimized ones where you do kind of zero copy into the GPU, all marshaled and 99% of the code is, is Python. And uh, because we don't need to change the data structures, because we can just you know, kind of do a zero copy from the, the, the NIC buffer into, into kernel space, that saves us a lot of overhead and that means we can be really fast even though we're using the slow language of Python. So it's on our GitHub along with lots and lots of other stuff, so if you're interested in, in seeing that, you know, go and have a look, there's a whole lot of stuff on that there. A bit about data storage, so I mentioned HDF5, which we use as kind of a scientific data container. Um, it's a really nice file format, it gives you kind of a hierarchical uh, data set and you can put attributes on it. It's, it's a really interesting thing, but it's quite, s well, we found it to be quite slow originally. So we used, we used H5Py, which is one of the Python wrappings for it, and we were kind of five to ten times slower than disk performance, which is pretty poor. So we wrote a kind of a benchmark with a whole lot of uh, test suites, and I won't bore you with these slides and all that stuff here. The bottom line is our original optimal set of parameters was completely wrong. Everything we had thought was our optimal way to construct this data and access it was, was off. And um, in particular, what we discovered was by using Pi tables, which is an alternate, effectively an alternate implementation. Um, it adds quite a lot of stuff onto it, but the one thing it does give you is something called BLOSC, uh, which is a block level compression technique. Essentially what you do is you take your data and you compress it in blocks, but you size those blocks to fit L2 cache of your CPU that you're working on. Then when you want to read that data, you copy that block into L2 cache, and then you've got all these spare CPU cycles floating around, so you use those to decompress this block on the fly. And the upshot of all that is basically the second blue bar, which says that our raw disk performance, which is the first column, 244 megabytes a second, this was uh, an, an, S an SSD, Using pi tables and using this BLOSS technique, we got to 273 megabytes a second. So this is the, ti this is the speed of getting the data off disk into memory available for NumPy to use. So it's faster than the disk and faster than the C implementation. Of course, the C implementation could use BLOSS and so and so, but the point is I didn't have to write any code to be faster than the fastest optimal C case I could come up with. And for us, this is really a key of why Python works in our HPC side of things, is because, in my opinion, Python, in terms of the way you can do I.O. and the way you can do data, you can get that very, very close to the maximum performance you can get out of your machine anyway. If you throw some cycles, if you burn cycles along the way, who cares? My CPUs spend most of their time doing nothing, just burning cycles. So if I'm 10 or 15% slow on the CPU side, that doesn't affect my problem. Obviously, that's just our problem, but it's, it's an interesting case if you think about where, where to optimize and where not to optimize. Other thing we're doing, these are some sort of more toy examples. Um, we have we spent a bit of time, we use matplotlib a lot, and so we thought, well, matplotlib is great, but anyone who's tried to use a matplotlib over an X-forward knows that it's really, really horrible. So we wrote a web, a web version of it, essentially, HTML5, using WebSockets, and um, so we use this currently for our, our live signal displays of the telescope, so the operators can get a screen that shows them what's happening in the telescope, you can view various parameters, and that's kind of web-delivered and, uh, and quite nice and quick. So, aha, the demo, lovely. Right, demo time. So this is where it all goes wrong. Depends if you're. Oh, fortunately, my computer rebooted, so I shall have to. So has anyone used the IPython notebook much? No one. Good. One person, two people, three people. Oh, it's growing as we go. So eventually, everyone will have used it. Excellent. Well, you can count yourself as IPython notebook users now. Um, so IPython we use extensively, as I said, and um, there's an IPython notebook, which is basically kind of a web interpreter, if you like. So that's what it looks like. What's nice about it is it lets you kind of, it lets you save your session. So I've got a saved one there as my H5 demo. Um, you can run each line, you can rerun lines, you can run it interactively. It's got a lot of really nice features. The thing it didn't have was decent, it didn't have interactive plotting. It could have inline plotting, so you could do a plot, and you'd get it in line, but it would be static. So we sort of hacked together this demo um, using our MPL H5 Canvas library. So who's used Pandas? Yeah, Pandas is really cool. And uh, so this is just a demo kind of stolen from the Pandas guys. 
and um, I'll just run that. So all I've done is I've read a CSV file in, which has got some nice uh, stock market prices, and uh, I'll plot that out. So what would have happened previously is you would have got a static plot. What you get now is you get actually a dynamic plot. So you can zoom in, do whatever you want. You can go home. I mean, well, it's interesting to look at the side screen. Ah, you can switch to pan mode if you want as well, pan around, that kind of thing. So what's nice about this is that plot stays active for your session. So you've done it and you've created it and it's there. You can go do other things. You can change the data underneath it and you can come back and, and do some more stuff there. So um, what I actually find this quite useful for, what it's doing over there, is uh, so you create a new figure and then you want to sort of you know, plot some stuff up and oftentimes you kind of plot and you're not quite sure what you're trying to get to. You, know, you want to plot something and see how it looks and maybe set a title... Both say attendance, forget that it doesn't say attendance. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, then maybe, you know, you decide, oh, that's no good, I want to actually change that. So you then do some sort of apologize, I can't see the screen. Not as good a typer as Armin, he was very good. Let's say five, one. Gonna work? Yeah. No. More brackets. No brackets. Three. One, two, three. One more brackets. More brackets. Interstep argument got to float. Ah. Sorry. I'm by. A range. Come back here. A range. Ha! Ah, yes. So that would be the attendance curve if people were drinking heavily. They would attend more because there was free booze and then they'd pass out and it would disappear again. That kind of thing. So your curve would come and go. The bottom line is it's very useful to be able to interactively plot because you can go tick, 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 figure out what it is. You can have all your commands saved in the history. You can save this let other people connect to it and continue working with it. So if you're interested in the notebook, I mean, if you're interested in sort of the way IPython does interactive Python and you want to particularly for exploring data, check out the notebook. And uh, if you want interactive plotting, check out the interactive plotting, which we will um, release out soon to the world, hopefully. Uh, right, let's go back. Demo, that was the page in case the demo didn't work. So another thing we've spent quite a lot of time on is looking to see at um, things like mathematical optimization. So a lot of our problem involves doing fairly complicated optimizations, uh, things like uh, a lot of convolution. There's a lot of nonlinear processes. So we've been looking at these and identifying them sort of piece by piece and deciding, you know, is the current implementation use, you know, useful to us? Should we use it? Should we write something new? And uh, the nice thing about kind of writing something new is that you can take what was previously written in Fortran or C or C++ and write it in a kind of a Pythonic mindset, and particularly a mindset that's suited to what we're doing. And oftentimes, because you've come up with a better algorithmic way to do it, you're faster anyway. So an example of this, and it does a lot of other things, is a compressed sensing toolkit, which my colleague Ludwig Schwartz has written. And if you want to know all about compressed sensing, ask him, not me. Essentially, compressed sampling or compressive sensing is about saying, if I've got a, a big sort of n-dimensional space, but I know that the signal inside it is very sparse. So imagine a big patch of sky, but it's only got say, five stars in it, or ten stars, little point sources in it. So this matrix is mostly sparse, massively sparse. What this says is that you don't have to fully sample as you would expect it, like in a sort of a Nyquist way. You don't have to fully sample your, uh, you know, don't, you don't have to fully sample the, the space to figure out where all these points are. Um, and I'll show you in a, a picture of what that actually looks like. It's much easier to see in a picture. Um, so essentially, it's a, it's a whole lot of methods that are inside this compressed sensing toolkit. Uh, things, nice names like orthogonal matching pursuit and basis pursuit, but different ways to, to find these, uh, these, these sparse signals hidden in your you know, sort of massive data. And what that looks like, if you sort of try and visualize it, is that um, we have some reference image of the sky on the top left there, which is you know, nominally quite sparse. It has a little bit of information in it. One of the problems with radio astronomy is if you do quite short observations, you get a lot of corrupting influences, which is the top right there shows you know, all these sort of corruptions that have occurred. The state of the sort of traditional state of the art of radio astronomy in the bottom left there, if you ran it through, that's the image you would get with quite a lot of corruption. The compressive sampling technique gives you the right hand side one, which not only is better, but it's five times faster than the C clean implementation. There's a lot of reasons for why it's faster, but it's the bottom line is it's still a much shorter Python script that's much quicker than this huge C edifice that, that did that. So if you're interested in this stuff, speak to Ludwig. He'll tell you about it. And I want to end off with a kind of another note about for me you know, why Python makes it so great, is um, we built this machine. There's a raw voltage capture machine. It's basically just a bunch of SSDs and, a, and you know, high-speed 
couple of 10 gig NICs and we want to capture that data to disk. So the parts for this machine arrived on Friday. We assembled it on the weekend, wrote a little bit of software, drove to the Karoo on the Monday, captured some data. On the way, the way home from the Karoo, we actually took a flight. So on the flight on the way home, I wrote a little Python script to reduce that data. And it's a bit hard to see on these projectors, but you can see those vertical, near vertical lines. And those are the signature of a pulsar. What you're seeing there is you're seeing this really distant radio source. It's 100 light years away. And it emits pulses of, it, pulses of radiation quite regularly, every you know, 100 milliseconds or so. And um, in a very quick way, we were able to take this very unformatted, unstructured raw data, quite a lot of it. Uh, it was like 18 gig or something like that. And very simply, in half an hour, write the code, extract the data, and get a nice plot out that showed that we were actually seeing the pulses from this uh, from Vela. And, uh, if, you, if you're interested in kind of pulsars and the, the dynamics of how they work, it, there's some new imagery from, from Chandra, and the, basically they, it's a kind of a zoom in onto the pulsar field, and you can see all these amazing shocks and bow waves, and really it's a really dynamical system uh, that already has uh, spread out this 100 light year diameter kind of wind nebula out of the pulsar in the 10,000 years since it went bang. So you know, it's kind of a, a plug for, for looking at these uh, very interesting and energetic, energetic things. Finally, to end off on the grand little trade, it's just to say, reiterate what people said before, you know, thanks to the, the whole community. I think the other a plus point that gets often overlooked when people talk about why we should use Python and, you know, talking to like people, the C++ guys, is because the community is just fantastic. You know, you can come into it from a zero base. Everyone's open. Everyone wants to help you. Everyone wants to, you know, see your project succeed. So, you know, big thanks to the community. And we, you know, we try to try to give back and, and be an active part of it. So thank you very much. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm sure they'll be posted on the... Simon, are they going to be posted? Anyone know if they can be posted on the icon? Otherwise, uh, I can mail them to you if you want. But I should put them up somewhere useful. I'll put them up somewhere useful and we'll make sure it gets sent out, yeah. But I should have a speaker's corner, whatever. Alex had. Cool. cool. Next question. <laughs> Somebody? There's one at the back. Ah. Uh, just an astronomy question. Um, there's been quite a bit of talk on the internet about uh, Nibiru or Planet X uh, with Google uh, apparently censoring a piece of Google Sky, putting a big black box over a part of it. Um, just wondering if you have any knowledge or opinions on that? <laughs> Google it's a bit off topic for Python. Yeah, sure. No, um, uh, no, I don't really have any particular opinions on Google's censoring of the sky. Uh, you know, I think if you're referring to Planet X, some sort of 10th or 11th planet or 8th, 9th planet now out there somewhere influencing the, the, the shape of the orbit of the, of the solar system. I mean, sure, you know, there's, there's sort of some unexplained orbital phenomenon to be had. I'm not sure why Google would censor it, um, but uh, perhaps it warrants further investigation. So we shall, uh, we shall train our eyes thuswards and see what is there and reveal all to the world. More questions? There's one over there. Yeah, that's actually on Google code. Sorry, was the URL not up there? It must have fallen off in this presentation. There it is right at the bottom. Code of Google MPL H5 Canvas. So basically, I mean, we wrote it, particularly the reason we wrote it was we were just tired of installing TK and GTK and whatever backend to use. So it's pure Python, has no, well, it has one dependency on a, on a, on a WebSocket library because, we were, again, we were tired of writing new WebSocket standards every time it changed. But uh, basically, pure Python, you can just easily install it so easy install is the best bet, actually. Um, MPL H5 Canvas, and uh, it's got some examples and things you can run and see see how it works. It's quite, it's also quite high speed. We can do animation at you know, about 100 frames a second, which is quite good, significantly better than some of the other animated backends. And uh, we're, uh, yeah, once we find some more time to it, well, maybe someone else out there will do some work on it because we wrote it and we haven't any time to do anything useful with it. So it's, it's still embryonic. Um, to partly tie into previous talks. Um, in your drive for performance, particularly where you were talking about uh, rewriting Fortran code, mm. do you make any use of PyPy? So, at the moment, we haven't. I mean, we've lo we've looked at it, uh, you know, a, a bit, but we haven't. Um, it's a case of again, we haven't got to that end goal of having to optimize. So far, you know, so far we've the stuff we've been doing has been good enough. Particularly, 
being very careful about exactly how we access data and how we use memory, um, we've been fine so far. We've, we've got a bit of a few basic kind of C extensions that we've used, but we haven't gotten too far, much further than that. But I, I'm, I'm certain in the future we will um, look at things like PyPy. Some of the Scythe and stuff is interesting. Certainly, someone mentioned LLVM, and there's some very interesting LLVM stuff coming out as well. So, where we need to really hotspot stuff, we'll, we'll look to see what performance we can get from the community. Any more questions? I have one. Um, the it's not about Python. The Python. layout of the Cat Seven uh, dishes yes. seemed random. Right. So, it is essentially, it's kind of I don't know. Random with with a with a goal in mind. <laughs> um, when you lay out these dishes, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you don't. What's what's important are the, is the baseline, so it's the spacing between any antenna pair. And you can imagine what happens is as your source kind of moves over during the day. Obviously, the Earth's turning, but your source appears to move over during the day. The projected baseline that that source sees changes. And what you need to look at is does your configuration, the way you've laid out these antennas, over a 12-hour track where the source moves and you get all these different types of projection. Does that give you a nice, consistent uh, sampling of possible baseline lengths? So we lay this out to make sure that we don't have, A, a lot of redundant baselines. So we don't have a lot of the same types of things which just sample. Um, it's a plane called the UV space. Essentially, that's where you, you put down your data um, based on the, on the baseline lengths. And so the configuration nominally appears random, but you actually do it to try and optimize and, and effectively want to get is a Gaussian shape in, in UV plane after. So it's quite a black art, but yeah, you, you try and explain to the construction guys, it's not random, put it in the right place. And they're like, oh, we can put it wherever we want, it looks random. So you've got you to keep a, you know, a close eye. They're like, look at that picture, we can put these dishes wherever we feel like. like no, 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 it must go there. Cool. cool. Simon, uh, one more question. Uh, sure, well, that's a good question. So we see about a degree of the sky at any one time with our antennas. And within that degree, we have this kind of uh, commensal observing where you can, you can look at different things within that field of view. So uh, for Meerkat, we'll have four beams, so to say, that you can kind of steer within that one degree field of view and see more. Um, there are other types of radio astronomy technology where you see bigger patches of the sky, so you can, you can do things more simul simultaneously. But uh, for us, it's a relatively small piece of the sky, but we're very sensitive to that small piece of the sky. One more. This one holding more. up lunch. Not yet. We still got a minute. Ah, beautiful. Um, with the tremendous volume of data that needs to be uh, analyzed and processed, do you ever foresee um, the functionality like we have with SETI, where you can offload the or distribute the computation of all of that across the world? Sure. So there's there's been quite a lot of activity on this. Um, obviously, SETI at home and things like Galaxy Zoo have been you know tremendously successful. I think where we see the need for that is, is not in the initial stage of the processing, where the volumes are so massive that to move that data out uh, is not only costly, it's interesting that the, the, the number of joules per bit to transmit data long distance gets to the point where when you're moving exabytes of data, you're using megawatts of power just to move the data. So the data's got to stay in the group. But where we do, where we will have this, is when you get to the kind of the end part, where you've got a, an image of the sky and you want to know what's real in it. Then absolutely, that kind of model of you ship it out to your your users and uh, they'll tell you, oh, that looks interesting, that doesn't look interesting. And you know, 100 people say it's a good thing, so you, you accept their, their, their strategy. But for the real kind of meat and bones of the, the, the front online processing, we don't see technology such as grid or cloud being applicable just because the data is just you know, too big to move, basically. Sure. So at the moment, uh, the, the beauty of building Cat7 is that, uh, you know, here's one we built ourselves, we just decide what we want to look at as it goes. But um, for, for Meerkat and the SKA, there's a time allocation committee. and Basically, scientists from around the world get together, submit a proposal and say, I would like 5,000 hours of observing time on this little piece of the sky, and they justify why, and then that committee meets and essentially allocates time. But it's not paid for, so it's, you know, basically if your proposal is accepted, you get free access to the, the telescope. It's provided as a service to the, to the community. Cool. Simon, thank Good. you very much. Cool. Thanks.